Hi guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to the desktop for another rules breakdown. And rather unsurprisingly, this week I'm going to be doing Star Trek role-playing game, 2nd edition. The 1983 Faza role-playing game. Now, there's newer Star Trek role-playing games out, and I have to admit, the most recent version, Star Trek Adventures, is absolutely brilliant. But, we're going over old rules here, so this is the one I'm going to cover today. Now, I've discarded the box as we won't need it. And for the samples of the rules, I'm going to use the example character sheet that the rules provide here for Lee Sterling, Lieutenant Commander aboard the USS Lexington. Now, while it'd be kind of fun to go later in the book and use Captain Kirk or Mr. Spock, the templates that they lay out here, the writing is absolutely tiny. So it's going to be much easier to show you on this character sheet. So I'm going to use this one. Now, for skills, there are a few different rules for it. So, if you're rolling against an attribute, then it's a percentile roll against the attribute. So, you're rolling against somebody's intelligence for figuring something out. You're rolling, and we've rolled a 56, which is under his attribute, so he succeeds. Now, in the rules, these are called saving throws. Because, usually when the character is actually trying to do something, they're going to use their skills. Now... Here we've got their skills below. There are three types of skill roles. There are routine tasks. Now, essentially, if you've got a skill over 10, you can automatically do a routine task. So a helmsman with warp drive technology, if his skills over 10, can make the ship go at warp speed. However, in this case, Lee only has six. So if he's rolling on his warp drive technology, he's not rolling percentile for a routine task just for making the ship go. He's rolling a d10 and trying to get under his skill. So he's rolled a 7 there, he fails a routine task. For more challenging tasks, if the character has time, then they can achieve anything under their skill. It's only when they're being challenged. So they're going to roll percentile. Now, if the Games Master's not sure whether it's something they should roll on or not, then he takes their skill from 100, and he tries to roll less than that. So, Marksmanship Modern, 20 here, take that from 100, is 80. We're trying to roll less than 80. We've rolled 37. So, the player has to roll on that. If the Games Master had rolled over, then it would have been an automatic success. Now, otherwise the character just rolls percentile. So, let's say the... What's a good skill here? There, Planetary Sciences Hydrology at 30. So we're trying to roll under 30 for him to figure something out. We've rolled 08, so he succeeds. Initiative in Star Trek role-playing game goes by one of two methods. One you make it up as you go along, players tend to go first, and they decide within themselves who goes in what order. Or secondly, by dexterity, going from highest to lowest. And it recommends that if you can't decide what order people should be going, if it's not obvious. Because obviously, if a group of NPCs have got an ambush on the players, then the NPCs will go first. But if it's not obvious, you go by dexterity. Now, combat skills work as a combination of your skill and your attribute. So, for firing a phaser, you need modern marksmanship. So, Lee here has it at 20. And he has a dexterity of 67. Now, you add those together and then half it. So, he has a total of 87, which halved is 43, because you round down. So, he has a 43% chance of hitting with his phaser. So, we roll... He gets 0, 5, these dice like rolling low, and he succeeds. And that's as simple as it is. There are obviously modifiers to the combat, if I flick over to the game operations manual here. Now, on page 35 of the main rules, we can see modifiers. So, aiming at a large target, you gain 15 points to your skill. Small targets, minus 15. 
If you've got a position modifier, you may get a minus five or a minus ten. If you're shooting at uh, kneeling or sitting targets who are smaller targets. We've got concealment modifiers, so minus 30 to minus 50. We've got modifiers for target's movement, so if they're moving quickly, you might get as much as minus 15. Aiming modifiers, so if you're aiming down your phaser for a couple of rounds, you may get up to a plus 25 bonus. Modifiers for the attacker's movement, so if you're moving, you might get a minus because you're running forward and trying to shoot at the same time. And that obviously modifies your skill. But again, it's dexterity plus the skill. So modern marksmanship for phasers. And there's, um, I'm trying to see the skill, personal combat. So personal combat unarmed, which is used for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now damage is really straightforward. If we turn into page 33 of the Starfleet Officer's Manual, we can see a table with various weapons. Now this table also has the ranges for the weapons. So you can see that firing a phaser at point blank range gets you a plus 15 bonus. Whereas short, extreme, uh, short, medium, long, extreme all have increasing difficulties until minus 45 extreme range. But we're actually looking at the damage here. So we can see that hitting someone in a club does 2d10 damage. So you roll 2d10, you add them together, and that's how much damage you're doing. So four, 9, 13. 13 points of damage for hitting some work club. However, many of the energy weapons have fixed amounts, so we can see that a phaser 1 does 75 points of damage. Once you determine the amount of damage that you're doing, you then actually have to apply it. And characters in Star Trek use their endurance as their hit points. So Lee here has 58 hits. But when he reaches 20, so he loses 38 of his hit points, he collapses. Um, he is now knocked off his feet and he can drag himself by a nearby rock and continue firing whatever, but he has been injured. And then when he reaches five, he collapses unconscious. And obviously reaching zero will kill him, unless of course the damage is stun damage. Now healing from that damage depends on two factors. If you're first aided, so a medical officer comes up to you, they can make a skill test and see whether they can first aid you. And that will generalize stable you, stabilize you or bring you back to consciousness or get you back on your feet, but you'll still be wounded. Most damage requires bed rest to heal in Star Trek. And it kind of hand waves that away with the character spend some time in sick bay. And finally, advancement. There's two advancement systems that you can use. Firstly, is the character goes through and rolls against every skill that they used in an adventure, every single one that they used. And if they fail that roll, then that skill goes up by one. Or, if the Games Master prefers, the character may choose three skills that they used or would like to increase, so the character's spending some time. They make the same roll, and if they fail, they increase it by 1d10. So they roll a d10 and add it to that skill. Now, obviously, that determines that they can learn certain things faster, whereas the first system, they only slowly increase what they're actually doing. Now, that is a very brief look over the Star Trek role-playing game rules. Now, obviously, it's an older system, so these rules are a little more clunky than we're used to with modern games. But... It's amazingly fast, and it is amazingly Star Trek. It waves a lot of things away to the way that things would work in an episode. So if a character gets injured, there's not a roll this and you recover in so many hours. It's a Star Trek thing of you spend some time in sickbay and then you're better when you're needed, which is very Star Trek. I kind of like that from a storytelling point of view. The Games Master can keep somebody in with a wound for... 10 days, or 15 minutes. It just whatever's needed. And it allows you to keep the main characters operational rather than them being knocked out of a game for a long time just because they made some bad rolls. But as I said, that's a brief look at the Star Trek rules. Thank you very, very much for watching, as usual. Please like, subscribe, and comment below. 
as it does me massive favours with the YouTube algorithms. But most of all, you look after yourselves. And I'll catch you later. Bye now.